morning, guys. Um, I hope everyone had um, a great weekend um, with it being a long weekend and everything. Today is a fun hot reads for everyone this summer. Um, I will be sending out at some point this at some point this week, probably sooner rather than later, um, some hot reads from Miss Shockley. Um, she did say that the hot reads that she's putting together for the summer for students will all be available on Sora. And Sora is the app that I'm using. Um, and it's super easy to get to. You just go to the library's page or web page. You look for the Sora app. Once you're in the Sora app um, or to get logged in, you need to put in your student ID. Student ID is not your username. It is not your password. It is the numbers that you would punch in when at the library, okay, when we would check out books, okay? So today, I'm going to kind of present my screen here. Today, my hot read that I am kind of really excited about, it's one of the books that I rented. I probably shouldn't rent it yet because I'm starting a different book. Um, but this book is a dystopian series um, and it is called Gone. Okay, it's by Michael Grant. And it says, the first in New York Times bestseller author, Michael Grant's breathtaking dystopian sci-fi saga. Meaning, when it's dystopian, it means like, what would our world look like if it fell apart? There's no order or like our current government ruling is gone or like what happens when our world is like falling apart around us. So some people might think like, Hunger Games is a dystopian novel. Like, what does our world look like after some sort of, like, disaster of some sort? So, um, but it is a dystopian sci-fi, meaning it's science fiction as well. And it's a saga, meaning it's a series. Um, Gone is the first book. It is a page-turning thriller that evokes the classic of The Lord of the Flies along with the horror of Stephen King. So if you kind of like some super suspenseful things happening, this seems like it would be the right book for you. Um, in the blink of an eye, everyone disappears. Gone. Except for the young. There are teens, but not one single adult. Just as suddenly, there are no phones, no internet, no television, no way to get help, and no way to figure out what's happened. Hunger threatens. Bullies rule. A sinister creature lurks. Animals are mutating, and the teens themselves are changing, developing new talents, unimaginable, dangerous, deadly powers that grow stronger by the day. It's a terrifying new world. Some sides are being chosen. A fight is shaping up. Townies against rich kids. So they kind of have social classes, it sounds like, those who live in the towns the, or townhouses or um, like apartments, that kind of thing, against those who are more rich from their parents, I guess. Bullies against the weak, powerful against the powerless, and time is running out. On your birthday, you disappear just like everyone else. So I'm assuming that must be their 18th birthday. So I, um, it has a lot of books in the series. So all these right here, it won't let me click and highlight, but... All of these books are in the series, so I'm extremely interested in reading it. So there's six books. Um, so it's a sci-fi, it's a thriller, young adult fiction, or literature. Um, so I'm going to read a part of that book today, except I need to put my gum out. So let's open the book. So, you guys can get a nice little feel of it. Alrighty. So, chapter one. By the way, I'm gonna, I saw this before when I was looking. 
But if you look at all the chapters, as you go down through the chapters, it's quite intriguing. It actually gets like a countdown going. So it goes from 273 hours to 128 hours. So the time's decreasing 100 hours, two hours. And then the last one is one minute. So I'm kind of curious like what that could be. What is the chapters counting down to? Is it from the main character's perspective of like how many hours they have left until their 18th birthday and they disappear? Um, so I'm kind of intrigued if that's the case. All right, so I'm gonna keep, start reading. One minute, the teacher was talking about the Civil War and the next minute he was gone. There, gone. No, poof, no flash of light, no explosion. Sam Temple was sitting in third period history class, staring blankly at the blackboard, but far away in his head. In his head, he was down at the beach, he and Quinn, down at the beach with their boards, yelling, bracing for that first plunge into the cold Pacific water. So I'm picturing this is like taking place in California because that's over on the western coast where the Pacific is. I'm picturing that this person is probably in high school learning about the Civil War. The fact that they have like third period class um, is another indicator um, helping me understand the setting. From, for a moment, he thought he had imagined it, the teacher disappearing. For a moment, he thought he'd slipped into a daydream. Sam turned to Mary Terfino, who sat just to his left. You saw that, right? Mary was staring hard at the place where the teacher had been. Um, where's Mr. Tentlake? Trentlake? It was Quinn Gat Gathier, Sam's best friend, maybe only friend. Uh, Quinn sat next to, right behind Sam. The two of them favored window seats because sometimes you get caught. You caught just the right angle and you could actually see a tiny sliver of sparkling water between the school's buildings and the homes beyond. He must have left, Mary said, not sounding like she believed it. Adilio, a new kid Sam found potentially interesting, said, No, man, poof. He did a thing with his fingers that was a pretty good illustration of the concept. Kids were staring at each other, craning their necks this way and that, giggling nervously. No one was scared. No one was crying. The whole thing seemed kind of funny. Mr. Trentlake poofed, said Quinn with a suppressed giggle in, her, giggle in his voice. So Quinn is a boy. Hey, someone said, where's Josh? Heads turned to look. Was he here today? Yes, he was here. He was right here next to me. Sam recognized the voice. Betty? Bet? Bet, Betty, Bet, we'll go with Betty. Bouncing Betty. He just, you know, disappeared, Betty said. Just like Mr. Trent Lake. So based on what the um, certain synapses of the book was talking about. I can assume that um, who was the original character they were looking for? Josh. So I'm assuming Josh was 18. And so these kids must be all seniors in high school. The fact that if Josh is 18 and he disappeared. All right. The door to the hallway opened. Every eye locked on it. Mr. Trentlake was going to step in, maybe with Josh, and explain how he was pulled off, how he had pulled off this magic trick, and then get back to talking about his, in his excited, strained voice about the Civil War that nobody cared about. But it wasn't Mr. Trentlake. It was Astrid Ellison, known as Astrid the Genius, genius because she was, well, she was a genius, Astrid was in all of the AP classes in the, the school had. In some subjects, she was taught, taking online courses from the university. Astrid had shoulder-length blonde hair, 
and liked to wear starched white short sleeve blouses that never failed to catch Sam's eye. Usually like starched blouses are like when you iron with starch, excuse me, it makes like a super crisp shirt. Astrid was out of his league and Sam knew that. But there was no law against thinking about her. Where's your teacher? Astrid asked. There was a collective shrug. He poofed, Quinn said, like maybe it was funny. Isn't he out in the hallway? Mary asked. Astrid shook her head. Something weird is happening. My math study group? There were just three of us, plus the teacher. They all had just disappeared. So all, all the kids in her group must have been 18. What? Sam said. Astrid looked right at him. He couldn't look away like he normally would because her gaze wasn't challenging, skeptical like it usually was. It was scared. Her normal, sharp, discerning blue eyes her wi were wide with way too much white showing. So her eyes must be huge. They're gone. They all just disappeared. What about your teacher, Adilio said. She's gone too, Astrid said. Gone? Poof, Quinn said, not giggling anymore. Or not giggling so much now. Starting to think maybe it wasn't a joke after all. Sam noticed a sound, more than one really. Distant car alarms coming from town. He stood up, feeling self-conscious, like it wasn't really his place to do so, and walking on stiff legs to the door. Astrid moved away so he could step past her. He could smell her shampoo as he went by. Sam looked left to down towards room 211, the room where Astrid's math, math wonks went, met. The door down, the next door down, 213, a kid stuck his out his head. He had a half-scared, half-giddy expression, like someone buckling into a roller coaster. The other direction, down to down at 207, kids were laughing too loud, freaky loud. Fifth graders across the hall, room 208, three sixth graders suddenly burst out into the hallway and stopped dead. They stared at Sam, like he might yell at them. So is this school like a high school and middle school in one or something? I wonder if it's like a small town, if that's the case, because if they have like students disappearing in their class, there has to be like 18 year olds. Interesting. All right. Perdido Beach School was a small town school. Okay, I should have just kept writing, reading. With everyone from kindergarten to ninth grade, all in one building, elementary and middle school together. High school was an hour's drive away in San Luis. Sam walked towards Astrid's classroom. She and Quinn were right behind him. Okay, so if this school goes to ninth grade, no one should be 18. Okay, that's like 14. I'm still kind of confused why 18-year-old students are disappearing. Unless they offer like separate classes. But then why wouldn't they say 12th grade? All right, sorry, I'm gonna keep going. The classroom was empty. Desk chairs, the teacher's chair, all empty. Math books lay open on three of the desks. Notebooks too. The computers, a row of six aged Macs, all showed flickering blank screens. Hmm, so that's interesting that the computer screens are blank. On the chalkboard, you could quite clearly see Pollyan. Pollyan. She was writing the word po polynomial, Astrid said in, the, in a church voice whisper. Yeah, I was going to guess that, Sam said dryly. I had a po polynomial once, Quinn said. My doctor removed it. Astrid ignored the weak attempt at humor. She disappeared in the middle of writing the O. It, I was looking right at her. Sam made a slight motion, pointing. A piece of chalk lay on the floor, right where it would have fallen if someone were writing the word polynomial, whatever that meant, and had disappeared right, bef right before rounding off the O. 
This is not normal, Quinn said. Quinn was taller than Sam, stronger than Sam, at least as good as good, sorry, stronger than Sam, at least as good a surfer. But Quinn was his half crazy, half smile with his half crazy, half smile and tendency to dress in what could only be a costume. Today was in baggy shorts, army surplus desert boots, a pink golf shirt and a gray fedora that he'd found in his grandfather's attic put on a weird guy vibe that alienated some and scared others quinn was his own click which was maybe why he and sam clicked so that kind of described quinn for us sam temple kept a lower profile he stuck to jeans and updated and understated t-shirts, nothing that drew attention to himself. He had spent most of his life in Perdido Beach attending this school, and everybody knew who he, who he was, but few people were quite sure what he was. He was a surfer who didn't hang out with the surfers. He was bright, but not a brain. He was good looking, but not so that the girls thought of him as a hottie. The one thing most kids knew about Sam Temple was that he was a school that he was school bus Sam. He'd earned the nickname when he was in seventh grade. Class had been on the way on the way to a field trip when the bus driver had suffered a heart attack. They'd been driving down H Highway One. Sam had pulled the man out of his seat, steered the bus onto the shoulder of the road, brought it to safe to brought it safely to a stop, and calmly calmly dialed nine one one on the driver's cell phone. Dang, the fact that the teacher didn't do that, but the kid did, it's kind of impressive. If he had hesitated for even a second, the bus would have plunged off a cliff and into the ocean. His picture had been in the paper. The other two kids, plus the teacher, are gone, all except Astrid, Sam said. That's definitely not normal. He tried not to trip over her name, when he said it, but <laughs> kind of failed. He, she had that effect on him. Yeah, kind of quiet in here, brah, Quinn said. Okay, I'm not ready to wake up now. For once, Quinn was not kidding. Someone screamed. The three of them stumbled into the hall, which was now full of, full of kids. A sixth grader named Becca was the one screaming. She was holding her cell phone. There's no answer. There's no answer, she cried. There's nothing. For two seconds, everyone froze. Then a rustle and a clatter, followed by the sounds of, of dozens of fingers punching dozens of keypads. It's not doing anything. My mom would be home. She would answer, but it's not even ringing. Oh my God, there's no internet either. I have a signal, but there's nothing. I have three bars. Me too, but there's nothing but it's not there. Somebody started wailing, a creepy, fleshy, crawly sound. Everybody talked at once. The chatter escalated to yelling. Try 911, a scared voice demanded. Who do you think I called, dumb, dumb nuts? There's no 911? There's nothing. I've gone through half my speed dials and there's nothing. So that tells me that what happened with the computer screens not, you know, all being blank. That, oh, oh, sorry, that something's going on with either the internet and like connection services or just technology in general. The hall was full of kids as it would have been during a class change. People weren't rushing to their next class or playing around or spinning the locks on their lockers. There was no direction. People just stood there like a herd of cattle waiting to stampede. The alarm bell rang as loud as an explosion. Okay, so there's some technology. People flinched like they'd never heard it before. What do we do? More than one voice asked. There must be someone in the office, a voice cried out. The bell went off. 
It's on a timer, moron. This is from Howard. Howard was a little warm, but he was Orc's number one toady. An orc was a glowering thug of an eighth grader, a mountain of fat and muscle who scared even ninth graders. So I'm picturing like a football player almost. No one called Howard out. Any insult to Howard was an attack on orc. They have a TV in the teacher's lounge, Astrid said. Sam and Astrid, with Quinn racing after them, pelted towards the lounge. They flew down the stairs towards the bottom floor where they were there were few classrooms, fewer kids. Sam's hand on the door of the teacher's lounge, they froze. We're not supposed to go in there, Astrid said. You care, Quinn said. Sam pushed the door open. The teachers had a refrigerator. It was open. A carton of Danbury blueberry yogurt was on the floor. Gooey contents spilled onto the ratty carpet. The TV was on with no picture, just static. Sam searched for the remote. Where was the remote? Quinn found it. He started running through the channels. Nothing and nothing and nothing. Cable's out, Sam said, aware it was a kind of stu stupid thing to say. Astrid reached behind the set and unscrewed the co coaxial cable. The screen flickered and the quality of static changed a little, but as Quinn ran the channels, there was still nothing and nothing and nothing. You can always get channel nine, Quinn said. Even without cable, Astrid said, teachers, some of the kids, cable, broadcast, cell phones, all gone at the same time, she frowned, trying to work it out. Sam and Quinn waited like she might have the answer, like she might say, oh, sure, now I understand. She was Astrid the genius, after all. But all she said was, it doesn't make any sense. Sam lifted the receiver on the wall phone, a landline. No dial tone. Is there a radio here? So no physical wires are working either. There wasn't. The door slammed open and in rushed two kids. Fifth grade boys, their faces wild and excited. We own the school, one yelled, and the other gave an answering hoot. We're going to bust open the candy machine, the first one announced. That's maybe not a good idea, Sam said. You can't tell us what to do. Belligerent, but not sure of himself. Not sure he was right. You're right, little dude. But look, how about we all try and keep it together till we figure out what's going on, Sam said. You keep it together, the kid yelled. The other one hooted again, and off they went. I guess it would be wrong to ask them to bring me a Twix, Sam muttered. Fifteen, Astrid said. No, man, like... No, man, they were like ten, Quinn said. Not them, the kids in my class. Jink and Michael, they were both mat math whizzes, better than me. But they had LDs, learning disabilities, dyslexia. They kept them back. They were both a little older. I was the only 14-year-old. I think maybe Josh was 15 in her class. Okay, so I guess if you're an adult in this society, you're 15 and older. That's weird. So, so he was 15, Quinn. He just, just disappeared, blink, and he was gone. No way, Quinn said, shaking her head. Every adult, an older kid, and the whole school just disappears? That makes no sense. It's not just the school, Astrid said. What? Quinn snapped at her. The phones and the TV, Astrid said. No. No, 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 Quinn said. He was shaking his head, half smiling, like he'd been told a bad joke. My mom, Sam said. Man, stop this, Quinn said. All right, it's not funny. For the first time, Sam felt like 
felt the edge of panic, like a tingling in the base of his spine. His heart was thumping in his chest, laboring as if he'd been running. Sam swallowed hard. He sucked in the air, unable to take more than shallow breaths. He looked at his friend's face. He'd never seen Quinn so scared. Quinn's eyes were behind shades, but his mouth quivered and a pink stain was creeping up his a pink stain was creeping up his neck so like i'm picturing like when someone's about to cry their face turns really red or is really frustrated and upset usually their skin gets pigmented more pink um or like a darker shade uh where was i astrid was still calm though frowning concentrating trying to make sense of it all we have to check it out sam said Quinn let loose a sort of sobbing breath. He was already moving, turning away. Sam grabbed his shoulder. Get off me, brah. Uh, Quinn snapped. I have to go home. I have to see. We all have to see, Sam said, but let's go together. Quinn started to pull away, but Sam tightened his grip. Quinn, together. Come on, man. It's like a wipeout, you know. You get launched. What do you do? You try not to get worked up, Quinn muttered. That's right. You keep your head straight through the spin cycle, right? Then swim towards daylight. Surfing metaphor, Astrid asked. Quinn stopped resisting. He let go of a shuddering breath. <sighs> okay, yeah, you're right. Together. But my house first. This is messed up. This is so messed up. Astrid, Sam asked, not sure of her, not sure at all if she wanted to go with him and Quinn. It felt presumptuous presumptuous to ask her and wrong not to ask. She looked at Sam, looked like she was hoping to find something in his face. Sam suddenly realized that Astrid, the genius, didn't know what to do or where to go any better than he did. That seemed impossible. From the hallway, they heard a rising cacophony of voices, loud, scared, some babbling, as if they would be okay, okay as long as they didn't stop talking. Some voices were just wild. It wasn't a good sound. It was, a, it was frightening all by itself, that sound. Come with us, Astrid, okay? Sam said, we'll be safer together. Astrid flinched at the word safer, but she nodded. Makes me wonder what's going to happen. The fact that the author chose to have the character say safer, like what dangers lie ahead. The school was dangerous now. Scared people did scary things sometimes, even kids. Sam knew that from personal experience. Fear could be dangerous. Fear could get people hurt. And there was nothing but fear running crazy through the school. Life in Perdido Beach had changed. Something big and terrible had happened. Sam hoped he would Sam hoped he was not the cause. What? Not the cause. So that makes me wonder one like why does he think he's the cause? Did he do something? Two, it makes me wonder, like, is this happening just in Perdido Beach? Um, and then another thing I'm wondering is why 15-year-olds and older? So a lot of wonderings I'm having. But I hope you guys like that book. It is called Gone. It is found on Sora. And um, I'm just going to close this out. And it is by Michael Grant. Um, so I highly recommend it. I'm interested. I'm probably going to keep reading it. Um, and it has a whole series, so it should keep you busy during the summer. Um, but tomorrow I'll have a different book for you guys that I would recommend. And I'll keep doing that each day. But I hope you have a wonderful day and you get outside and that you liked this book. So if you're interested, check it out on Sora or your library. Um, I'm pretty sure Brown County Library is open for curbside pickup, if I'm correct. Um, but if not, you do have the Sora app, and that is pretty useful. So 